on the show today, Kayla June. So Kayla June, I know as the rolling around the floor lady, because I've been enjoying her uh, online uh, floor work classes tremendously, which are really very good. I've been doing those myself. And she also runs some, something called the Soma Kines School. Am I saying that right? Did I say I'm... Soma Kines. Kines, that's it. Kines. You just told me. It's been a long day, Kayla. It's been a long day. Okay, I've been looking forward to this as the highlight of my day talking to you. So welcome. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. And being the highlight of your day, I mean, now it's the highlight of mine. I just woke up, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the best so far. It's going gonna, it's gonna to get better. Okay. How did you get interested in the body, Kayla? How did that happen? I grew up in my mom's dance studio. So, um, you know, early on dancing and performing and it was my life. So th there it is. And we had a small studio and I was also, uh, you know, a teacher in my mom's studio and a costume maker and a rehearsal organizer and a choreographer and a studio cleaner and managed the moms, <laughs> you know? So it was a, it was quite a learning experience and that's yeah how i came into movement what is they say in japan they say the child who grows up next to the temple does not have to be taught chanting i mm -hmm. sort of just sort of learn through being around it and being exposed to it yeah mm -hmm. that must have been an experience yeah and, and how do you describe yourself now when people say that dreaded question at the imaginary cocktail party because let's face it no one goes to fucking cocktail parties but the imaginary cocktail party when they say what do you do how do you answer that well it's really going to depend on who asks me honestly right so um, i try and formulate my words yep. to kind of match somebody you know that thing i mean um uh, you know, but I've really come back around to being really simple about it, that I'm a movement teacher and that I work with other movement teachers to help other people move and feel better. Great. So you're a movement teacher. That makes it simple. Not too pretentious. I like it. But you're working with other movement teachers. So you're running programs for movement teachers. Yep. You got it. And if, if someone said, like, what's your spec? Now, I know you as, again, the floor lady, but I don't want to pigeonhole you. So if someone said, like, what's your specialism, what would what would you say? Well, I would then talk about what my vision is, because I think that's what makes my work unique, which is right. bringing the movement arts and the movement sciences into a cohesive whole. So in my own educational pathway, you know, I started as a dancer. So that led me into, you know, the more kind of like the movement arts and the discovery based stuff and somatic movement and performance art and all of that kind of thing. Uh, and then the questions that I had eventually led me to the other side of what I call the movement education spectrum, which was exercise science and personal training and corrective exercise and function and all of those kinds of things. And what I found out is that the two worlds don't talk and they should. Right, right. Okay. So this is something I think we share is bringing worlds together. It's one thing about the conference and the podcast is communication between different worlds. So what have been like the main chunks of your training then in terms of, you know, is it you know, I'm doing a little bit of your work, just literally just a few hours of classes. It seemed like Feldenkraisy, a bit of BMC, a bit of dancey. Like what, what are some of the main chunks that have influenced you? So certainly contemporary dance and improvisation. And then in terms of somatic movement, the kind of biggest influences that, you know, I had initially, and that still are really informative, was that intersection between Bartini of Fundamentals, you know, uh, Rudolf Laban's work and body mind centering. So that intersection, and that's a pretty common intersection uh, that, you know, correlates often with con contemporary dance training and uh, technique. However, you know, I just got so interested in somatics, Mark, what I have to say is that I went on to understand all of the pioneers to the best extent that I could. So I either found teachers or teachers of teachers or, you know, I went into uh, learning from books or went into personal exploration. Um, a really good friend of mine who's been on this path as long as me, Don Hartman, she and I started leading dance laboratories and no, bringing no. together. Yeah. Uh, you knew her. It's yeah. Out in, it's out in Boulder, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. We're friends. Yeah, we're yeah, friends. She's my longest bestie. Uh, longest, uh, longest okay. Bestie. Yeah. So, um, so then, you know, authentic movement and somatic experiencing um, were, you know, a few others that really became pretty prevalent uh, in terms of transforming my life. 
Um, you know, in terms of Feldenkrais, I know a lot of people come to me and say somatic groundwork feels a lot like Feldenkrais. I've never really gotten into Feldenkrais too much. Of course, I've read his books and I understand who he is. And I mean, he's he's amazing pioneer. But in terms of movement practice, that really hasn't been one that I've okay, interesting. entered into. Yeah, too interesting. much. But yeah, okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the somatic groundwork then, just as that's been my sort of point of contact with your work. I'm hearing it's much bigger than that. Um, why would anyone want to roll around on the floor? Let me play uh, chair's advocate. So what, why, why do we want to do that? The work for somatic groundwork began on the floor to kind of start from the beginning. If we're talking about really creating a, an optimal learning environment, there's a little bit of unwinding that often needs to happen. <laughs> um, and Primarily, that comes from befriending the nervous system and giving the nervous system some time to regulate, as people say, or harmonize, as I like to say, but really dropping into parasympathetic tone so that we can be more receptive, so that we can actually learn new patterning, so that we can make conscious choices, so we can come out of the habit, so we can actually find our body breathing itself that whole thing. So one of the most supportive ways to do that is coming into connection with the floor because then we have that additional benefit also of grounding, connection with gravity, this is called yielding, and that's very supportive to our living architecture, to our tissues. Um, so there's also a sense of inner stability and safety that comes from uh, beginning that way on the floor. I guess so, if nothing else, it's like, if you, whether you're dancing or doing martial arts or yoga, you can always fall over, right? And that is a basic fear people have. And if you're doing floor work, you can't fall over, right? Like, you know, like Aikido is all about making people fall over. or Yoga is about doing funny things and trying not to fall over while doing the funny things, which is sort of challenging falling, you know, not falling over. Dancing, we're playing with our edge, you know, and there's always that risk that we could take it too far and fall over. But with groundwork, that... And they say it's the only fear we're born in, possibly with some people's snakes as well. But you know, that basic single, singular fear we're born with of if we're going to just is out of the picture. And then just physically, your muscles can relax more, right? Like it takes a certain amount of tonality to stay sitting or standing. You know, days like today where it's been a long day and I'm underslept, I can actually feel that it's taken a certain amount of effort to stay sitting up. You know, that is, even though if I sit in lovely and poised and my best Alexander or whatever, it, it still, it still takes a bit of effort. Whereas on the floor, there's a like muscle tone can release more just because it's like, it doesn't have to. And then maybe lastly, there's always like this spiritual component to ground. Mm -hmm. You know, we say that's solid ground. You know, is he standing on firm ground? It's like the ground was pulled up from underneath me. You know, I've been in an earthquake and it's a really disturbing thing when that, solid metaphor gets taken away so I, so I wonder if it's sort of those three plus more isn't it that makes ground i love i've been rolling around the floor in aikido for years i love it and mm -hmm. so you know took to your classes very naturally and um yeah it strikes me there's a number of features that combine for a sort of nourishing experience absolutely i mean this connection with the ground is fundamental and no matter what posture we're taking whether we're standing or sitting or in relationship with somebody else we're also always in relationship with the ground and with space. And I kind of, you know, had this aha moment uh, in my early 20s as I was really starting to understand how to use my body more efficiently. You know, I grew up in the kind of very heavy ballet uh, kind of technique kind of training, right? And there's just a lot of work <laughs> in doing ballet, a lot of holding, a lot of gripping, at least that's how my body took it on. Um, and it was very difficult, you know, I was an advanced ballet dancer on point, all that kind of stuff. But it was a lot of work to hold myself up out of the ground. And when I learned that I didn't have to do that, that I could actually let go of all that work and use the floor as my partner, mm -hmm. and then begin to connect into space and be held by space in the ground, suddenly there was this ease and freedom and ability to relate that completely changed everything. You know, there's something about that ballet tradition which underpins so much Western movement of holding oneself up mm -hmm. away from the floor. And, it, and, and like, I still, sometimes I see that as a trauma pattern, particularly some of my gay friends, gay male friends, that this is sort of holding oneself up above the ground, you know, like, ew. Uh, and that's in ballet too. And, and sometimes, you know, it's sometimes that the ground is bad somehow. It's almost like in Western culture that it's lower class, you know, like upper is better. That seems to be sort of built almost into our 
moral system of language is high morals rather than low morals you know there's a way in which that's built into a whole cultural linguistic structure that the floor is somehow hell is down right heaven is up yeah yeah it reminds me of aesthetic and like what we classify as high art versus kind of low art kind of thing and i mean ballet is beautiful and the aesthetic of ballet is you know really really something to marvel at um and it's you know quite quite a feat the ba ballet dancers are athletes in in a beautiful way i found for myself though that i i just got really interested in what's what's my natural being what's my natural body and i don't want to walk into dance class anymore and get ready and prepare on center and suddenly be in this other posturing like who just walked in the door <laughs> and who's going to walk out of here and walk to the street i don't want that to be a different expression uh -huh. That's right. interesting. Do you have to be a different person when you enter the yoga studio and put on the spiritual voice or the martial arts place and put on your tough guy hat? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, do I have to be a different person in here? Because if so, I'm going to leave that different person here and it isn't going to go to the rest of my life. Yeah. It's funny, you said on point earlier. I, I got totally confused. This is a military term. So, so on point means to be like in front of the other people on a patrol. Um, <laughs> So there's also a bat that means like on your toes in ballet. Yeah, right? the point shoes, mm -hmm. the hard box point mm -hmm. shoes. Okay, I should do a ballet class one time just to see what it's about. I was in a Gaga class the other day. I accidentally signed up for the pro one instead of the, the public one. They have two kinds of Gaga classes, you know, it's like the, the for professionals and for muggles like me. And then I accidentally signed up for professional and they started doing plies, you know. And I was like, what the fuck is this? I think I was really freaked out, but it's fun though. It's fun. It's different, a bit different for me. You got this, Mark. I, I, got I, it. I, I, was, like, I was like, oh, that's why everyone here looks gorgeous and muscular. I was like, looking at the Zoom, I'm like 20 kilos heavier than any motherfucker on the, sh on the Zoom, you know? I was like, oh, it's the, it's the dancers class I came to by mistake. Anyway, so what about developmentally? Do you think this kind of a... Uh, my experience of when I did floor work in Systema or Aikido, as soon as I get down to the floor, it can make me like childlike or animal-like. Do you know what I mean? Like it brings out a different side of my personality than when I'm jumping through the air, you know? Like, well, is there something developmental in that lowness to the ground as well, you think? I mean, for me, absolutely. You know, the, the kind of vocabulary of somatic groundwork is highly informed by developmental movement patterning. And so that's not only kind of our, <clears throat> our whole body patterns, but also the, you know, the kind of the underlying support. So reflex activity, um, and then also what we call the fundamental action. So this is yieldings where we begin on the ground and then the pushing force production and force transmission through the fascial matrix and how we choose to use that force through the body. So, so there's that piece. And then by going into these, I would say kind of primary places of movement development, places that we've traveled through before, things that have been adapted and compromised and changed and restructured over time. We have an opportunity to really kind of check into the sensory experience of what's happening. And then the repatterning piece allows us to say, okay, well, how is that affecting my thinking mind? How's that affecting my beliefs? What's coming up for me? I call these perceptual artifacts, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, and is this actually true? Do I believe that? Or am I kind of just holding that because that's what's there? That's my habit. Yes. And then how does that inform the way I move and relate out into the world? So that's really how we kind of use that sensory motor feedback loop in somatic groundwork. We follow sensations up to perception and then make conscious choices about how we're, we're moving from that. Uh, yeah, from the feedback loop. It's kind of funny, isn't it? People are like, no, this is this is true. This is what I believe. This is the way the world is, and it's like, yeah, that that's a muscular holding pattern in your body. It's like no, it's not really any different than indigestion or a cramp, you know. And yet, it's become a world view. It's become a way of looking. It's become a belief system. It's those things going to hold together that way. So, I just, well, they're all. I mean, as you know, there, I was going to see the comedy of that as you said it. Well, it's all, it's all embedded there, right? So what was a, a muscular holding pattern or an adaptation to, you know, forces that we had to manage in the world or repetitive action or whatnot, 
and also becomes informed by the feeling tone that's underneath that. And then maybe there's some defense mechanism in that or some protection in that. And then suddenly that's just what we do and how we are. And we don't even realize how that's affecting the way we think or um, the way we orient, those kinds of things. And that's why I got really interested in using the body as a primary vehicle for change is that I had some pretty um, incredible, <laughs> life-changing, uh, dark night of the soul kinds of experiences in my own life where it was, oh, moving into my body, into this wilderness here, and then creating change from the body up is also, you know, affects then how I am in my mind. And I was much more interested in body up, bottom up processing than going into the mind and hashing out all this stuff up here to then transform my experience. I, I really just, you know, like the other direction. <laughs> right.